Greetings, one and all, and welcome back for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine. I'm thrilled to be back with you again today. Uh, this is a subject that has uh, been very much on our minds this, this year, the um, centennial of carrier aviation. Uh, we've uh, dealt with it in the magazine. Proceedings has uh, got it on the cover as well. Um, and we celebrate that today in a very special and personal kind of way. Uh, joining me with uh, his article, it just dropped on Naval History Online, uh, hot off the press just yesterday. Uh, it's a beautiful piece. I recommend it to everyone. It's author and journalist Ed Offley, who uh, is well known for his World War II histories, and he's graced the pages of the magazine already twice this year, uh, including the cover story back in January, February. And it's great to have him back on the podcast to discuss a life time spent in love with aircraft carriers from boyhood through his naval career to his career as a journalist and the many carriers that he got to know and love through all that time and here to talk about all that is our good friend ed awfully about talking about his article my lifelong carrier deployment hello ed and welcome back uh, good morning eric glad to be here yeah well great to have you too i can't think of a more We've looked at the, um, you know, the first U.S. carrier. We've looked at all sorts of aspects of the centennial year. But this is a good kind of heartfelt approach to the material. Um, a first-hand account of uh, many of the great carriers that you've uh, known over time. And I think it's interesting that, like so many of us, your interest in this sort of thing kind of goes back to boyhood and uh, model building uh, in the specific case of carriers. And from that, small acorn grows the mighty oak, so to speak. So why don't you uh, go ahead and kick us off with how your uh, lifelong love affair with aircraft carriers began. Well, it started out at the People's Drug Store on Route 50 in Fairfax City, Virginia, one spring night in 1956. My older brother and I, my father was in the Air Force, and we had this, uh, it was a quasi-tradition, every week we'd go down and they had a huge, huge shelf of uh, model airplanes, cars, trucks, and ships. And we'd spent time building B-24s and P-51s and things like that. But one night I decided, I don't think I'd like to build a ship. And so I grabbed a, a Revell model box off the shelf, and it was this carrier called the USS Midway. So I glued it together, put it on my bookcase, and thought I lived you know, happily ever after. Well, as I used to say, 13 years later, I got orders to it, which is true. And I found uh, myself at Hunters Point Naval Shipyard in the winter of 1970, uh, marching aboard the real thing. And it was what I thought was going to be just a chapter in, um, you know, in, in my existence. I spent uh, just under two years on the ship. Uh, we went from cold iron on, on the tied up to the pier to a fully deployable aircraft carrier with an air wing departing Alameda on May 16th, 1971 for the Western Pacific. And as you can imagine, we, uh, I and the other uh, guys on the crew, the air wing, we had a full uh, spectrum of experience. We, we got liberty in Hawaii, uh, thanks to a, uh, a storm that hit us off the California coast. We got an extra week there because it ripped a 16 foot hole in the side of the ship. Um, so we spent, you know, about a week and a half in Hawaii, then headed west towards uh, uh, the Tonkin Gulf. And it was it was a kind of a nice culmination of a very unhappy, stressful, dirty, around-the-clock year of drills, firefighting, damage control, uh, general quarters that, you know, everybody hated, but you did it. And, and along the way, you sort of learn to appreciate that if something really bad happened to your ship, uh, you all be in a, in a position to be able to, you know, take care of the problem and, and, and save yourself from, from disaster, you know, and we had several of them during the uh, 60s. So anyway, um, my time came up. I got off the ship in uh, QB Point in the Philippines, flew home, and I thought, okay, that was interesting. I'm going to get on with my life. And I became a newspaper reporter. I worked for three newspapers in Virginia. Uh, over a 10-year period, and it was while I was uh, working up in uh, the foothills of the uh, mountains in Charlottesville 
that one day I saw a, an innocuous story on the on the newswire about an aircraft carrier that had been deployed to the Middle East for eight months because of the Iran hostage crisis. And the poor sailors on board at one point hadn't seen land for, I think it was over 140 days, uh, no liberty, no enjoyment, just around the clock uh, operations. And they're on their way home. And some people in Hampton Roads, uh, Norfolk was where she was home ported, said, you know what, let's welcome the crew home. Let's give them a big welcome home bash. And that kind of intrigued me because I never thought of it. Uh, when you're in the military during the Vietnam War, I, your hope was to come home and uh, you didn't think about whether or not anybody was going to welcome you or not. In fact, um, I had a peripheral experience years later. I was interviewing a three-star army general about his experiences in the service and he had explained he was a major in Vietnam and I think he got mildly wounded, not hospitalized. And I said, what was your, what was your homecoming like? And here's this grizzled 60-year-old you know, infantry guy looked at me for 30 seconds and, and he burst into tears. And I thought, oh my God, I've never made a general cry before. But it was essentially the, the hidden pain and angst that every vet, uh, veteran from that era felt. And I was surprised that when I read this article, I actually felt a little twitch of, hey, that didn't happen to us. And it intrigued my curiosity. So I said, okay, I'm gonna go down and, and cover it, you know, write an editorial about what the event was like. And so uh, it was May 26, 1980, got down to Norfolk, um, joined this group of about three or four dozen reporters and cameramen. Excuse me. <clears throat> and they flew us out to the battle group just off the Virginia Capes. And being from a tiny paper, I didn't I didn't rate it to get on the carrier itself. So they, they put me and some others on the USS Texas, which is a, a, a wonderful taught warship. Uh, and the good part was I had a vantage point to see the whole thing with the carrier in the background because we led the formation into Hampton Roads. And it was truly uh, one of those rare things in journalism we call a real event. I mean, so much of life today is stage managed and, and practiced and, 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 you know, green screened and everything. But this was a genuine outpouring of affection um, that I don't think the Navy had seen in, in a decade or more. And it was very moving, even to cynical, you know, journalists like me. So anyway, we got in. There were hundreds of boats in the in the Hampton Roads. They were blowing air horns and waving banners. And some of the younger girls were uh, essentially showing how fit they were, um, if you know what I mean. And the three ships tied up. It was it was just you know, tears, laughter, joy. It was it was just a tremendous experience. So I sat down in a, a, a news that my friends of mine had uh, in Norfolk, banged out my editorial, and went home, um, thinking, okay, that was a nice event. Well, totally unbeknownst to me, a year or two later, I was, I was essentially fishing around for a new newspaper to work for, and I sent off a package that included the piece I'd written on the Nimitz upcoming, and it landed in Norfolk, and... Uh, the editor there, George Hebert, hired me to be one of his editorial writers. That's and great. You know, sort of set the stage. That's a very moving part of your article where you describe the homecoming of the Nimitz and the um, fanfare of the crowds. The president himself is there, uh, uh, welcoming him home over the 1MC. It was such a marked contrast from coming home from Vietnam. And that kind of resonated with you, did it not, at the time? Oh, yeah, it did. And, you know, I was so glad to get off the plane at Travis Air Force Base. You know, at the time, I didn't even think about it because, you know, I was, as they say in the Navy, I was so short. I'd use a lighter to look up through my zipper. I mean, um, but it did. It resonated. I mean, I, I, I come from a military family of several generations and, and they have stories and some of them are very heartwarming about things like that. Uh, we just drew the short straw, I guess, in the 60s. Um, yeah. So the contrast is what, what, what actually intrigued me. And one thing led to another. I, I like to tell people, like every major life decision, I just kind of wandered into it, like most people. But I got to Norfolk, and, and the kind of bizarre coincidence was one year after that homecoming, I was sitting in my newsroom uh, office, 
and came word of this horrible flight deck uh, crash that had happened on the Nimitz off the Virginia Capes the night before. Um, uh, EA-6B Prowler coming into land uh, completely missed the, not just the arresting wires, but he, he veered off the landing path and plowed into all the aircraft in the forward part of the flight deck, killed a, over a dozen sailors and seriously injured, you know, several dozen more. It was, it was, it was a pretty nasty uh, experience. And I, my editor said, well, why don't you put something together on that, just a commentary on, you know, explaining what it is. And as I mentioned in my column, I said, I found I didn't have to look up anything in a book or a reference manual. All my memories from training on the Midway and, and serving on it at sea just came erupting out of me and practically dictated what I wrote. And, and uh, that happens sometimes. And essentially, I talked about the guys on the roof. These are the people you see in the JAG episodes in the, in the movies, but they have essentially the most dangerous job on that ship. They're, they're doing a choreographed ballet of moving these 20-ton jet fighters around. At any moment, they could either be blown down by the exhaust or sucked into the air intake if they're not careful. Um, and, and this goes on 24-7, 365, hardly ever gets a mention, taken for granted. But when something like this happens, you realize just what these guys are dealing with. Mm -hmm. And an article came from that that uh, sort of set you on the path to be um, a journalist covering the military. The fact that you were able to do this from your own personal experience gave you such a leg up. I mean, there probably weren't a lot of guys in the newsroom who could bring that sort of bravitas and um, real lived experience to the insights of that article. And it uh, kind of set you on a course, did it not? It did. And, and you know, the thing I, in all candor, I found sh kind of surprisingly shocking. I mean, Norfolk is the Navy capital of the world. When I interviewed for the job, my boss said, OK, I'm going to give you a two part quiz. What's the number one thing in Norfolk? I said, well, the Navy. And he goes, yeah, what's the number two thing? And I threw up my hands and said, I don't know. He said, laundry mats. You think with that, you know, dominance by a profession, um, there would be a whole cadre of people on the news staff who, who, who had some expertise in it. Uh, we had two military writers who, who did the news articles, and they were very professional and informed. But the rest of the gang, they, they didn't know port from starboard. And so I was instantly an expert. Um, to my great amazement, my two years on the Midway made me an expert in something. <laughs> so my editor said, you know, this was good. Let's, let's keep doing it. And I decided to, to, to sort of make an effort to not just write about it, but become a student of all the, uh, not just carrier aviation, not just the Navy, but, but the whole military. And it was a great period to do that because this was when Reagan had just come in and promised the 600 ship Navy and the rest of the military buildup. And so I had a, a great on-the-job training for the next four or five years. Um, and some of the things you learn, you didn't expect to learn. I'd like to veer into a very telling anecdote, and I'll try and make it as short as possible. I spent five years in Norfolk hanging around admirals, um, hanging around the rituals, the ceremonies, the commands, you know, the operational stuff. I flew out to Seattle in 1985 and joined the newspaper there. And shortly thereafter, they asked me to actually become the military reporter. We didn't have one. Um, large military state, but, you know, they hadn't bothered. And my first my first assignment was to fly out to this Air Force base in Fairchild, Washington. We had a nuclear B-52 wing. And I spent a week there interviewing, briefing. And the last day, I got a flight in a B-52. Well. We were flying down the runway to take off. We had a major in-flight emergency. You know, the cockpit lit up like a like a pinball machine when you're whacking. I heard the, the dreaded words that you never want to hear a pilot say, which was, oh. And <laughs> we got into the air. I had to spend five hours circling burning fuel. Came in, landed. You know, everything was safe. We couldn't get off the runway. The steering for the nose wheel didn't work because of the hydraulic failure. So I had to stop in the runway, climb down through the hatch in the bottom of the plane, climb out on the tarmac, blinding sun. And I'm standing there kind of getting my sea legs back. And this blue car comes racing up. And I see on the license plate, Eagle One. So it's the wing commander in charge of 
you know, 40 B-52s or whatever. And so I wander over to the car to say hi to him. And having been with the Navy the last five years, I go to the back of the car and look through the rear window. And I'm looking at a first lieutenant. And I hear this voice say, I'm up here, you idiot. And I looked over and the colonel was driving the car. <laughs> and I thought, aha, I get it. And so over the course of a beer or 10 at the Oakland that night, I explained to him my mistake. I said, I'd been around admirals for five years and he always rode in the back of the boat. And I said, but you're the pilot, so the senior guy gets to fly the plane. And he <laughs> goes, that's right. So I said, I got an idea to save money. He says, the next time there's a joint conference, get all the Air Force generals to go around and pick up the admirals and take them to the conference. You'll <laughs> save the taxpayer money. Oh, I think the admirals might like that, actually. Well, he looked at me for 10 seconds and then said, go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned a lot, but sometimes it comes in sideways. <laughs> sure it does. Uh, journalism is a fascinating career because each story you do is kind of a, a, a learning experience in itself. And you end up gaining a lot of knowledge as you cover a beat. And I'm sure that's how it was for you as well. Um, Throughout, and you're covering Army, Air Force, all of it, but you always come back to uh, the Navy at some point or another. Uh, carriers keep entering and re-entering your life. Um, you mentioned quite a few of them. Before we go on to any more of them, let's go back to the Nimitz in uh, 1980. That, uh, And you can see here again later as well. But I was trying to think about this. I'm pretty sure there's a movie called The Final Countdown came out like 1981, something like that. And it's about um, a modern day nuclear aircraft carrier that ends up in some strange vortex and ends up back in time. It suddenly has appeared in uh, near Pearl Harbor, Hawaii on the eve of December 7th, 1941. And then they have to grapple with this twilight zone scenario. Do we destroy the um, Japanese and save the American fleet from what's coming at Pearl Harbor? Or if we do that, are we going to change irrevocably the course of history? And who knows what will happen? And it's a, it's a really kind of, it's not the world's greatest movie. It's Kirk Douglas, I think, is in it. And um, it, it's just kind of a kind of a cult classic, if you will. But I'm pretty oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever heard of it? Oh, I've seen it. They, they filmed that movie on the Nimitz the summer before. She went off on her Mediterranean deployment to turn into the Iranian uh, extended uh, thing. It was that cruise. It was the summer cruise. It was around that time. It was the one before they went to Iran. Okay. That's they were doing their workups. You want to know the, the, the Hollywood miracle is that how did they get the Nimitz, which was based in Norfolk, at the end of the movie to come into Pearl Harbor? I know how they did that. It's very Hollywoodish. Okay. They, Kitty Hawk, which was 63, and they had scenes of the crew and, the, and, the, and you know, you see this, uh, the sail structure with a big number on it, but they put the yellow crane right in front of the three so you don't really see it, and it kind of looked like an eight that had been covered up. He said, that's how they got the Nimitz from Norfolk to Pearl that's Harbor. Pretty crafty, I have to say. Well, the, the thing that endures about that movie, it's a cheesy movie, but it's so, so much great actual footage of the Nimitz in action during that tour, um, during that cruise. And so the footage of that, that's sort of a time capsule of a, a, a U.S. carrier circa 1980 in action. And that's what's enduring and uh, valuable about that movie still. But anyway, I I thought about that when we were looking at the Nimitz in this time frame and um Thank you for uh, verifying that. Yeah. I'm not surprised you've seen it e as well either. I recommend it to anybody who can uh, stomach some of the um, hollywood ishness of it because it's a bizarre story idea for sure. <laughs> I mean, think about that. If they unleashed all the fury and firepower of a modern carrier in the Pacific in December 1941, who comes up with this stuff? So, oh, yeah. Well, anyway, the real life Nimitz um, in the real world is be revisited um, again and again. We'll come back to that. But um, if you had a favorite carrier, and this is probably a uh, 
facile question to ask and a tough one to really answer. Do you have a favorite, a sentimental favorite? Does it always go back to the midway since that was your first encounter, your first love? Or It's, it's a little tricky. I actually was thinking about this last night. Um, obviously, I should say the midway. You know, I had a model of it. I served on it. I covered it three or four times after that. But there's a little bit of love-hate there. Um, my wife and I took a Panama Canal cruise a couple of years ago, went from Fort Lauderdale around through the canal, ended up in San Diego. And we we're just half a mile down the uh, waterfront from the Midway Museum, which is a very, that ship never looked that good in real life. Uh, but one day, uh, Karen had never been on it. So we walked over and, you know, I remember we walked up this little ticket booth and there's this young woman in there behind the, the, the grate. And I said, how much? And she said, you know, I don't know, 12 bucks each. I bought the tickets and I paused and I looked at her and I said, you know, I remember when I would have paid you $50 to get off the damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, actually, I, I think it's the Nimitz and only because it kept showing up in my life. One of the weird things that happened uh, during the four and a half, five years I was in Norfolk I, uh, or even before that, I, I must have covered it two or three more times at sea. Um, she went off on her next deployment in 81 and had the Gulf of Sidra incident where the two of the air wing planes shot down Libyan uh, aircraft that were being hostile. And so she came back from that deployment. I did a media embark out to her, did one or more. So, you know, you got to know the ship. And along in 1985, I moved out to Seattle and I was there a year. And they suddenly made an announcement that they were shifting the Nimitz from Norfolk around to Bremerton, Washington in Puget Sound. And I told my editor, I said, you know, I know this sounds crazy, but I think that ship's following me. And it came around and what made it a unique opportunity, what makes something news is, is due to a whole bunch of reasons. Norfolk and San Diego, just for two, have had aircraft carriers forever. Seattle area, Puget Sound, there's Everett, Seattle, Bremerton. They had not seen an aircraft carrier since World War II in their waters. And so this suddenly was news that could be reported on. And it gave me a, a unique opportunity. And, and the Navy was very uh, helpful with this to literally write a series over time on what this whole 14 month pre deployment workup actually involved, what it meant for the people, the families, the ship itself. And, and you know enough of it to know how how incredibly complicated and hard, hard it is. Uh, each squadron has to become fully fitted in its training. The air wing has to come together and learn how to do their combined operations. Then they have to get together with the ship and learn how to cycle and operate on the ship. Meanwhile, the crew has to learn their jobs. One of the things that was fascinating when I did my first interview on the ship, this is in 1987 at Puget Sound Naval Shipyard, uh, Brent Bennett was the commanding officer, and I remember uh, marching along with him and, and several other people uh, to this, uh, I guess it was one of the, uh, the squadron wardrooms, or, or, or all the new sailors were seated around, and there's like, I think, 30 sailors sitting there, and, and Bennett raised his hand and said, how many people have been on an aircraft, uh, no, how many people have been out to sea on a Navy ship before? And like four people raised their hand. And he said, how many have been on an aircraft carrier before? And all four hands came down again. So, it, it, you know, I knew this intellectually that you have a 25 to 30% turnover every year on every major command and ship. And so that means every year you've got to bring a third of your crew from brand new, don't know much about nothing to becoming a trained member of a team. And that's just the ship's crew, the air wing, the same, the squadrons. So it impressed me what kind of a actual labor this is going to be. And so I was able over that 14 month period um, to follow the ship, the crew, the air wing. And, and we had two squadrons from air wing nine. They were based up in Washington state. So I was able to give them close attention too. And it was hard work, but boy, it was, it was very rewarding to tell a story that my readers knew nothing of. That's, yeah, 
and that's helpful for, I think for the citizenry to get an inside look at that sort of thing. Well, my goodness gracious, Ed, we've got some uh, questions from our viewers. Um, let's see what we've got here. Uh, Harry Lime asks, huh, Harry Lime, very good. I know who that is. Was the CV-43 the first carrier with steel flight deck? No. I think the Hornet had steel decks when we were on it. They started out with wood, but the Essex classes that got modernized, and there was a whole zillion of them still operating in the 60s. I don't know if you remember that, the Hornet, the Bonham Richard, the Ticonderoga, Ariscany. Um, their, their middle life or whatever overhauls, they'd been given angled decks and steel. So, no. And 43 was a Coral Sea, by the way. Right. There you go. I hope that helps um, answer that. Um, let's see. Roberto asks, did you ever have to do Freedom of Information Act stuff? Any all the president's men, deep throat style uh, moments in terms of uh, your career as a military journalist? Um, yeah, not with carriers, though. Um, I also had a long and, and complicated and rewarding and frustrating experience with the submarine service, and I'm still waiting for some of those requests to come back. Um, the military, um, I would give them mid-range marks for responsiveness. It depends on the subject, depends on the legitimacy of the classification. If you want to get frustrated, try getting anything out of the Department of Energy. Um, I filed a request for them once. Uh, Ten years later, you know, I, I was in a different city, different newspaper. The series I'd written had long since been published. And I finally got a letter back saying, you still interested in this? I said, sure. Um, and, and that was 20 years ago, and I still haven't heard from them. Um, <laughs> essentially, um, you, have to, you have to be really seriously wanting to pursue a protracted, even uh, bureaucratic and legal struggle if you know it's going to be up against the what they call the exemptions, the security exemptions. Um, this is no place for it, but somebody asked me about my research into the USS Scorpion. Uh, that that took 25 years. Oh, my. And that that um, was uh, for your book, Scorpion Down, correct? Correct. correct. Right. But, but the submarine service starts out classified until proven otherwise. Yeah. And I understand. I mean, it's, it's not, not nefarious. I mean, that's what they do. Right. Well, it is the silent service, and that's sort of cautiously inherent in who they are and what they do. Yeah. But, yeah, you have to be, um, you definitely have to be determined to, uh, if you're trying to dig out a story and you have to go up against the FOIA requests and all that. Um, well, I'll tell you, Eric, uh, what's weird is when it's the other way around. I mean, I had one episode where, and I think it was the new one that came to mind. Um, I got a call from the public affairs saying, hey, the Nimitz is getting underway in a couple of weeks. Would you like to ride with her out to Puget Sound for the day? I said, sure. When's she leaving? I said, I can't tell you. I said, what, am I supposed to tread water and wait for it to come by? <laughs> However, 1996, I'm minding my own business. The Nimitz is somewhere off of, I want to say Indonesia. And there's a sudden flare up in the Taiwan Straits, like we're having today. Um, yeah, it's been kind of quiet for years, but all of a sudden, you know, there was saber rattling or whatever. And um, the Pentagon, um, Joint Chiefs, whatever, dispatched, they, they diverted the ship at high speed to come all the way around, come up past um, Vietnam and China and the Philippines and do a, a, a transit of the Taiwan Strait, which a carrier had not done in, in a quarter century prior to that, 1996. So, you know, I, normally I wouldn't have known this. I mean, I don't have ESPM sitting there at my desk in Seattle. And the phone rings, and it's a senior Navy uh, public affairs guy I know in, in information office in the Pentagon. And he says, how would you like to interview the carrier Nimitz Battle Group Commander about the Taiwan Strait situation? I said, sure, how, how do you do it? <clears throat> he said, give me your phone number, and they'll call you at 6 o'clock tomorrow night by satellite phone. Okay. Six o'clock the next night, my phone rings. I'm talking to the carrier group commander. He hands it off to the ship CO. I talk to the air wing commander, get all the nitty gritty. And because of 
what the geopolitical situation dictated and what the Navy, I don't know if they had to shit any admirals to do this. I actually was able to write a story that said, when combat aircraft from the USS Nimitz appear on Chinese air defense radars tomorrow night, it will signal the U.S. resolve to send a carrier through the Taiwan Strait. You know, a week earlier, if I tried to write that, they would have taken me out and shot me. Mm -hmm. but, hey, you go with the flow. Yeah, well, you have to respect the embargoes, but um, isn't that amazing how that is? If you say it before an embargo, so to speak, um, yeah, that's it. Off with your head. But once after that, you know, no one else has said it yet. You still have that scoop. So this, well, this was a, this was this was an anti-embargo. This was a go for it now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I wasn't the one pushing. So yeah, yeah. Well, I guess here. Yeah, miracles happen. I don't know. <laughs> well, there was a um, what's there's one you, you see a lot in its twilight years. We haven't talked about uh, that one yet. Let me see if I can find that one here. Oh shoot! It's dropped me out of your article. Well, while I scroll through that, um, what's another one we mentioned in there that um, you actually see it several times in its like final phase of existence? Oh, you mean you mean the the, uh, the end of a carrier's commission and service? Yeah. Oh, I I had a bunch of those co coming and going. There's a couple I had to leave out. I didn't have enough room. Um, well, actually, I, I, I got to do my own ship at Midway. That was, that was to me, quite a, an, almost as emotional a moment as the Nimitz homecoming. Uh, she had been sent off to Yokosuka in 73 to be the only Ford-based uh, carrier, and now it was 1991. She had served with distinction in Desert Storm, and then the evacuation of the people from the Philippines after the Mount Pinatubo volcano. Uh, and now she was, you know, essentially they brought her back for decommissioning. And she took the Great Circle route from Hawaii and ended up having a three-day port visit in Seattle before going back down the coast of San Diego. And, you know, the local public affairs guy, I don't think he was aware I'd been on the Midway 20 years earlier, but he knew I liked to cover carriers. And he said, how'd you like to cover it? I said, that'd be great. So... I got a, a final cod flight from uh, McCord Air Force Base out to the ship. And I asked around, I, it wasn't the last airplane to trap on the ship. It was one of the last ones. She was coming down the Strait of Juan de Fuca. She had a, a handful of F-18s on board. That was, one of their squadrons was being reassigned to the Lemoore from, from, uh, from Japan. And I get to spend the night up on the bridge with the captain and the navigator and then walked around talking to to other people, and I suddenly realized it was 20 years I'd been walking those same decks in the Tonkin Gulf, and it, it, you know, you have to get to a certain age to start appreciate, appreciating things like that, because when I first joined the Naval Reserve, you know, it was all 25 years since the Battle of Midway, and we thought, oh, that was 100 years ago, and now, you know, 25 years is like, well, what were you doing last year, you know? So, it was a healthy personal appreciation of a flow of history. And yeah, and that's interesting to think that the Ed Offley of 1970 and then the Ed Offley of, of that moment, the Ed Offley of 1970 would have never dreamt that later you would be there in sort of that twilight moment for the same ship. Uh, that I wouldn't, I wouldn't have believed it. I would not have believed it. Yeah. I was down in San Diego on another complete assignment and I read in the paper there was going to be a change of command um, at North Island for the Naval Air Force's three-star. Uh, and the guy taking over was a friend of mine from the Nimitz, uh, Captain Brent Bennett, was now a vice admiral taking over the West Coast Naval Air Forces. And I called up and said, hey, I'm in town. I'd, I'd love to cover the ceremony. So I walked on board the Kitty Hawk over at North Island. Had a nice, you know, it was a very small story, but a nice, you know, event. Uh, had a chance to talk to Mike Borda. He, uh, he was there to preside as CNO. Well, here, here's the fun part. Uh, last year, I was negotiating with the Navy to talk to the uh, battle group commander and the captain of the Nimitz when they were coming home in, in 2021 from their COVID deployment. 
And I, I actually got a chance to chat with uh, the Chief of Naval Information, Rear, Rear Admiral Charlie Brown, and he was most helpful in helping set things up. And it was just an idle conversation, but toward the end of the business, I said, well, what about you? Uh, where'd you start your career? He said, well, I, I started out in public affairs at Comnev Airpac. I said, oh yeah, I was there up and down over the years. I, he, I said, uh, when did you start? He said, well, I was commissioned in 1995. And I said, well, that's weird. I, a year later, I was at the Airpac change of command ceremony where Brent Bennett took over and uh, Admiral Porter was speaker. And here's the chief of naval information. He said, "Yeah, I was there. I was helping set up chairs. I was an ensign." So I thought, "Keep flowing, keep flowing." <laughs> my, my, my. Well, I have unearthed the um, uh, mystery ship. I was trying to um, conjure the name of it's uh, Independence CVA sixty two. You had some recurrent experiences with that one as well, correct? Well, I, I used that one because it was a it was a, a nice broad spectrum from from uh, farce to, uh, to victory, I guess you could say. Every year in Seattle, with one or two exceptions, they have the big summer uh, f festival, hydroplane races, the Blue Angels. And the Navy has always sent a, a group of, of ships in for a port visit like they do at Fleet Week in New York. <coughs> Excuse me. And this year, they uh, I think it was 91, summer 91, the Independence came in with half a dozen other ships. I thought, okay, I haven't been on the Independence. So I think it was a helicopter load out to the ship. There were about five or six of us from the media. Got on board. It was a nice sunny day. We steamed slowly into uh, into Seattle, docked at the port, and then nothing happened. And, you know, after about an hour, people were going, why isn't anything happening? And nobody was saying anything. And the sailors were muttering. And finally, I buttonholed, you know, the officer of the deck or something. I said, okay, what's happening? And he groaned and he said, they brought the wrong gangways over from the shipyard in Bremerton and we can't get anybody off the ship. And I said, including the Admiral. He says, uh-huh. So, uh, stop production for four hours while they load the other gangways on a giant flatbed trailer trucks, drive them around, which, by the way, is all the way around Puget Sound through the, on the Tacoma Narrows up the I-5, which is crowded. Oh, so, so we finally got off that one. <laughs> I had a happier encounter a year later. Um, a guy named Joe Pruer was carrier group one. He later became SyncPAC and the ambassador to China. He was just a one star then. I got to go out and get a tour as they were cycling off of North Island. And he showed me with absolute pride and dignity this huge digital computerized CIC, you know, windows and email and everything. And I said, uh, is this going to revolutionize the way you guys do business? He goes, yeah, if we can keep the sailors away from it. And I said, why is that? He said, well, we we're doing a full system check last week and suddenly everything went black and it took our techs, you know, I don't know, five, six hours to fix it. Turns out there's a sailor in the corridor with a buffer and he whacked into the whatever, the fuse box, and that was that. The you early know, days of digital. Making it sailor-proof. Yeah, that's right. Well, you mentioned Joe Preer. I have to point out the Naval Institute um, has Admiral Preer's oral history. We recently published it um, not too long ago. And uh, you're right. It's a remarkable career that straddles the fields of um, the upper echelons of the Navy and also uh, important diplomacy as well. Uh, so... It was a uh, really timely oral history, as it turned out, because of the China factor that is um, so interestingly covered in it. Uh, that's nice you had a, a personal interaction with him. Well, he said something really interesting. Uh, years later, he gave a speech in Seattle. I think this is around the time, 96, 95. And he said, you know, people ask me all the time, he says, you know, what are we going to do about China? And he says, I tell people, don't worry about it. He said, our grandchildren are going to be working the China problem. Um, and that's, they are right today. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Well, this, um, this piece, it's a wonderful piece. If you've ever served in a carrier, I think this piece will mean a lot to you to read. And I recommend it if you haven't already pounced on it. But you close out with a, um, 
It's, it comes full circle to the Nimitz, doesn't it? You're, uh... It started and it ended with the Nimitz. I was um, minding my own business. I work at home now. Um, I haven't been in a newsroom in about five years. I briefly went back to my newspaper here, but for other reasons, after Hurricane Michael. But I was, you know, reading the news, and it was just like 1980. I saw an AP story about this aircraft carrier. This one had been over. Its cruise actually was 11 months because of the Theodore Roosevelt outbreak in Guam in 2021. When the Nimitz got ready to deploy, it was the it was the next they call it the ready carrier or whatever. The Navy was so careful to not have another Theodore Roosevelt outbreak that they brought the sailors, the crew on board a month before departing um, the United States, and it was like a fast cruise that lasted thirty days. They were literally cut off from the land. I don't know how they brought supplies on board, probably by helicopter or crane. They were completely isolated for 30 days before they ever even got underway to go down to San Diego and pick up the air wing and go on off on their deployment. And then when they got over there, Iran flared up again. They got held over two more months. So that was nine and a half, ten months. I, I lose track of the length. But that was two or three months longer than 1980. And this time when they came home, there couldn't be a homecoming because of COVID. Mm -hmm. They did it digitally and, and they got the word that people were thinking of them and wishing them well. And I was able, you know, thanks to, to Admiral Brown at Chinfo to, to get a link with the battle group commander and, and the CO and they talked about how they essentially done a medical miracle while making this record long deployment. And I finished off and I shamelessly acquired a quote to me that, that, that brings us all back. Uh, it was from one of the sailors. He was able to speak to a New York Times reporter. And they said, what are you doing now? And the guy says, I want to walk on land. I'm paraphrasing. He says, I want to listen to a river. I want to hear birds sing. I want to hear the wind in the trees. And I thought, that's another thing we take for granted. You put 5,000 people on that ship, send them off for six months. Okay, they get Liberty and, you know, Brunei or you know, Bahrain or whatever. But they're out there like like the mariners of the Columbus here are just, they've got the sea and the sky and the stars, but they're so far away from their land that they miss it. And it's nice to be able to remember that. And uh, that's what made that that article particularly satisfying for me was, you know, not just coming full circle like Halley's comic, but but being able to remind people that you know, these are people on board and they they deserve to be recognized. Amen to that. Well, um, I'd like to wrap things up here with another quote, um, perhaps from a more Korean source, but uh, it's a quote from a T-shirt, and you start your article with this quote. And I think it's um, a very great quote. Less than 1% of Americans have ever seen the sunset from a U.S. Navy aircraft carrier. I have. Popular t-shirt slogan. That was a good thing to start with, Ed. I have well, to, I've never seen that t-shirt, but now that I, if I ever do, I'll be like, uh-huh, there we go. They keep trying to sell it to me on Facebook. <laughs> Well, to those of you out here who have that T-shirt, um, bravo Zulu for a great quote. Uh, Ed, this is a wonderful piece. It, it covers the Naval career and a career in journalism covering the Navy. Uh, you've had a fascinating run with aircraft carriers and the subject matter in general. And um, we've been thrilled to have you in the magazine. I look forward to having in as soon as we can get another story idea from you that um, We'll go for it. Uh, looking forward to that. Um, I uh, would point everybody to this in Naval History Online, my lifelong career carrier deployment. Um, Ed, this has been great. It's fun to uh, reminisce with you and hear your sea stories. And um, I hope everybody else has enjoyed them as well. And I look forward to having you back on here again, Ed, next time. And thanks again for joining us. And I guess that's it for us, folks. 
um, thank you for um, taking part in this. And um, if you want to get more involved, if you're not already, I would encourage you to become a member of the Naval Institute, uh, where all the, the great discussions happen on uh, carriers past, present, and future. And you can just go to the Chiron prompt there, and it's easy enough to join. And then you're part of this discussion from this point forward. Uh, we look forward to seeing you here again on the next Naval History Podcast. Until then, I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine, bidding you a fond farewell. <laughs>